Great. All right, this is uh, session number 20, what's available with the data portal, on the data portal. Um, description is, uh, data portal is a one-stop shop for UDOT data and tools, including open data, uplan, linear bench, highway reference online, and report auto generator. Auto generator. This session will include an introduction to what is available, as well as highlight some of the new mapping galleries. Um, 90 minute session, and I think by the time I finish um, introducing everybody, we'll almost be done. Um, the presenters are Sarah Regard. Uh, Sarah is a GIS analyst and environmental planner with BioWest. She has worked directly with UDOT GIS for over a year, assisting with UPlan, the data portal, and GIS needs in the department. Uh, David Alger, it's Alger, right? Alger. Uh, David started with UDOT as an intern in 2006 and is currently the technology engineer in Region 1. Adrian Welsh, um, he is a GIS analyst for UDOT Region 2, and he'll be demonstrating the maps and apps for the Region 2 gallery on UPlan. Uh, Aaron Pinkerton, a, Aaron has worked for Region 3 since 2010 and with GIS for the past year and a half. Paul Damron. Paul has been with UDOT for three years and most recently in Region 4 for one year as a full-time senior GIS analyst. He received a bachelor's degree from Southern Utah University emphasizing in GIS, computer programming, and CAD. Chris Meredith. Uh, Chris has a bachelor's degree in geography from Bowling Green State University. He's been with UDOT for 14 years and is currently a GIS analyst for the Asset Management Group. And myself, Corey Unger, um, I'm a GIS analyst at the Complex. I've been there for about a year now. And let's see, this session is CEU eligible. There's a roll up here for you to sign. Um, and once we get started, I'll pass around the clipboards. <coughs> Excuse me. So, without further ado, we'll jump right in. Um, as I said, this um, session is called What's Available with the Data Portal. So, what is, <coughs> excuse me, what is the Utah Data Portal, the UDOT Data Portal? Um, the UDOT Data Portal <coughs> is, a, <coughs> excuse me, one-stop shop uh, that, that has a uh, kind of little itch in my throat where you can go to to find uh, all things uh, spatially data related. So uh, we've got featured applications. You can uh, search our catalog for, oh, thank you. That'll probably be better than the coke. <coughs> search our cat, <coughs> just in time. Search our catalog for data. You can download data, request new data, or find training videos that we've published. Um, you can browse our featured applications, uh, including Linear Bench, UPlan, and um, our projects map, as well as find up to the date UDOT data news. Um, and without further ado, I'll turn it over to Sarah now. So I'm Sarah, I'm gonna be talking about open data and doing a demonstration of how you download uh, data. This site may look familiar. We've had it roughly a year now. Um, we've been using it because it's free with our ArcGIS Online subscription. It offers tabular downloads and filtering right out of the box, so it saved UDOT some development time. And it ties to the REST services that we're using in UPlan. So what you see on UPlan is what you're downloading through open data. So it helps to streamline that process a bit. There are two ways to get to open data. If you're on the data portal and you enter a search term here, it's going to instantly bring you over to open data and the search results for uh, what you entered. If you're a UDOT employee and you're logged into the data portal, it's going to take you to the old interface and only show you the uh, private layers that are available to you as a UDOT employee. So keep in mind, if you're looking for a public data set, don't log into the portal. 
um, and I'll bring you over. So this interface is open data here. There's a few ways to search. You can use the search bar up top, or you can use any of the uh, groupings along here. The groupings kind of work on key terms, so they're not perfect. You will find some duplicate data sets in assets and maintenance. And, uh, so keep in mind, if you're wanting to find all our data sets, you can look at the data list to find what we have available, or you can just hit enter uh, in the search bar, and it's going to return everything that we have. You can also search within the map, but I don't recommend it because all our data set is all our data is statewide. So as you zoom in, you're always going to have 92 data sets because it works off the data extent. So I'm going to do an example with program of projects plan, which is an EPM layer that supports three-year plan and step. Several of our EPM data sets have two geometries, so if you're wanting to capture the full data set, you'll need to download both points and lines. Um, for this, I'm just going to use the line layer because there's more data in that. Uh, the first page it brings you to is a details page. There's some metadata, uh, a sample set of attributes, who made it, I'm the author of it. Uh, there's a REST service link and a few um, tag information. So you can review this information and decide if it's the data set that you're looking for. If you think it is, you can download it right away. Um, but that wouldn't be a thorough demo, so I'm going to go through the other features. Within this table, you can uh, filter. I'm going to take off the filter by map view. So some of our fields have quite a few attributes. If they have a lot of attributes, you'll have to manually type in what you want. Otherwise, uh, it'll bring up some radio buttons with some options. jumping around, it's catching both the keypad and the mouse. So I'm going to search just on transportation investment fund projects. And then region three. So you can see there's fewer options here, so it gives you the option to just select it. So we have 79 transportation investment fund projects in Region 3. And as I filtered the table, it filtered the map up here. And if you have just a simple question that you want to answer uh, within the map, you can symbolize it um, a few different ways. So I symbolize it on pins so you can see the individual projects that are occurring. Is it, oh, is it? There, sorry. <laughs> and you can click on them and it'll bring up the attributes just for that individual feature. And if you click on this page, it'll just take you to a bigger window um, with all those features in it. The charts page, keep in mind this is not Excel, it does not work that great, and it only works off of numeric fields unless you're using the donut chart. Um, so you can make a quick little chart. So I have this aggregated on plan construction year and then project value. So as you can see, the majority of the projects in the data are projected out to 2040 um, with quite a few less for the uh, previous years. You can embed the chart if you like. It'll give you the HTML to do so. Um, And then moving ahead to downloading. If you click this, it'll give you the option to download the entire data set. Uh, you can do spreadsheet, KML, or shapefile, or you can download just the filtered version. You can also use the API links, which again, they'll give you the filtered and unfiltered version. If when you've 
selected to download and it doesn't seem like it's working, there's the My Activity button. This will give you the status if it's still gathering data or if there was an error. If there was an error, email us at u.gis at utah.gov. And that goes to myself, Corey, and Becky. Uh, let us know what you're looking for and we'll email it to you. If you're looking for a data set that's not on open data, then you'll have to contact the department directly. So if, say, you're looking for more detailed crash data, you'll have to contact traffic and safety. But if you're not sure, you can just give us an email and we'll get you pointed in the right direction. So that, oh, and the other thing is if you need a M enabled LRS, open data doesn't support measures, so email us and we'll get you the <coughs> M enabled version. So that ends my section. Oh, no, it's back to Corey. I uh, forgot to mention during my coughing fit that uh, I'd like to encourage you all to go onto the Whova app and like our presentation, preferably now before you see the rest of it. Um, so um, how many in here have heard of Uplan and, or been to Uplan? So this will be fairly redundant for most of you, but for those who haven't, I'm just going to give a quick overview of essentially Uplan and our front page here. Um, there are several ways to find data on Uplan. You can use the featured maps, um, uh, what do you call this? Ribbon. Ribbon. Here, scroll through these and, and see some of the featured maps or apps that we're trying to highlight. Um, oh, it says right there, Ribbon. Uh, you can look through the galleries up here at the top. Got my laser pointer. Uh, Scroll through uh, the various galleries that we've put together. You can find uh, maps by going directly to the region galleries um, over in this very neat map over here. Or you can search for data here on the search bar. And in the search bar, you can filter either looking for maps, uh, layers, apps, tools, um, or files or groups. Um, that's the overview for that. And now I'll turn it over to uh, David. Okay, so I'm going to be focusing just on the Region 1 gallery. As was noted, you could access this by clicking on the Region 1, which is the top of the state, on the Uplan front page, homepage. And so, just kind of an overview of the gallery. We have some maps and apps and services. For now, there are maps and apps. The hope is to get them more towards just apps so that it's a more uniform interface for each of the apps. And then one thing that has just been added, or two things, is the tips and tricks one here which is just linked to a Google Sheet. So if anybody has any tips or tricks they want to share, um, I'm going to continue to try to update this. Internet's running slow, isn't it? To where you can just get different tips and tricks on different uses of GIS in general. And then there is also a link if you're using the UPEL app for environmental. You can access it here rather than having to type in the website. If you have a bookmark, you can continue to use your bookmark as well. It is running slow, isn't it? But, uh, and if you're environmental, you kind of know about the UPEL app, I'm sure, already. Yeah. Do you know when that presentation is for UPEL? Thursday for more detail on that. And so let's look at just this traffic and safety app for an example. And with all these maps and apps, the goal is to make the data that's on Uplan just more of a customized view for how <coughs> we want to view it in the region and also as any consultants that are working for the region. 
So if you have any suggestions on what you would like to see, send me an email at dalger.utah.gov. And with the apps, you have different layers that you can turn on and off. And um, if you are used to the maps, sometimes you'd have to click on the names to get down into the sub layers. And the purpose of the apps is to make it to where you can more easily see what information is on there. There is also the legend tool here, and you can print off some maps if you would like to do so. And by default, it's a PDF but there are other options available. And then there's also the draw tool on the apps where you can draw different things. If you're wanting to just get a presentation together, you can then print it as a PDF and send it to your group. As well as the measuring tool which if you use the measuring tools in most of the maps, you'll notice that the default is normally in metric. The advantage of the app is that you can actually change the default measurement to feet, but then allow users to choose other measurements if they would like to have different information. And you can also do it in the three different areas. And so there are many uh, pro bigger projects that have maps and apps out there. As you can see, we have the West Davis Corridor map and app that you can access different inf information through this. And so if there are any bigger projects that any of the consultants are doing, we have the capability, if so desired, to put them in the Region 1 gallery so that the rest of the people working for us can see it as well. And so you can see this is very similar. You could have the different layers that you can toggle on and off and zoom in and everything like that. And are there any questions on what is on here? Yes, Jeff. Yeah, so a map is from Esri, and so it has the data, which would be a service, located on it. And so it has just this generic interface, and that's where you'd have to click on the names to get to the sub-layers of the different things to turn them on or off. And then an app is more of a customized interface, but it's based on a map. So the map is created and then you create the app to customize that interface. And the service is just the data. There's another question. Yeah. Yeah, so just maybe you could talk for a second about uh, how, you know, say, let's say there's a particular project where it's putting a lot of uh, material online and these web maps. What's the, what's the process that you go about to decide if it should go, if it should be hosted in this data portal, and what that looks like, and then how long do you maintain it? Yeah, so the ones maintained by consultants are, like the West Davis one, are actually hosted on their server, and so it's up to the consultant on how long they want to maintain it. And typically, they want, from what I've seen, it's best if they're wanting to get the information out to the public on if they would want to host it on these because the public has access to all of these as well. All you need is an internet connection to get to any of these things. So that's the main application. And do you at some point transfer or would you, would there be a situation where you would transfer and host that permanently from your servers? There's, I'm just going to jump in here. Yeah. There is a standard process for that right now. Um, we're, we're talking about piloting that with a few, a few consultant firms on projects to sort of define when that needs to come in. But we, we definitely want to be able to harvest the data from these projects and have them have the data that we can use it again later. Um, so if you have a project, if any of them have a project that they want, 
connected through here? Let one of us know if you need to talk to Regent or just email you at GIS and we'll work with you. Um, I think some of this is still very new and a lot of that isn't really well defined. So you may have an option to help us figure it out in more details. So you can be a pioneer in the field. Any other questions? Okay, I will turn it over to Karen. Okay, it's maybe a little bit redundant to what Dave is showing in his gallery. I might open a couple of maps maps just to get them started before we go on. Can I close these tabs? Do you all need to open them? Don't close them. <laughs> you, need, you need to open them. You need that one? Okay. Okay, I'll leave them open. Gosh, y'all. Okay. Let me see where my stuff at. Yeah, they will fall apart. Is that better? Can you hear me better now? I need to talk louder. Okay, so fine. Okay, so I'm glad you asked the question about the difference between maps and apps and services. With these galleries, as you can see with David's gallery, it's similar to this. Is um, it's we try to do, use these thumbnails here to signify what they are. So you'll see in the corner here, there's, this one is, uh, gosh, this one's a map, this one's a gallery. A gallery is a collection of maps or apps, and the ones that say service are the ones that are just basically your map layers, and I don't have any services in the Region 2 gallery. The Region 2 gallery is a way to showcase what we've done in Region 2, to um, put stuff out there for what's going on in the region. We also have some statewide things as well. A lot of things we have in here, the Important stuff is done behind the scenes, so I can't really show off how cool some things are, but uh, for the time being, our active permits is not really be as active right now because we have some DTS uh, people changing positions, I guess. Um, one thing I wanted to show, though, is where to go. Oh, that's good. So that can't be added to the map, but it's there. Uh, with this permits layer, is, well, I'm working with Tony Lau on permits, and he's generating a spreadsheet using a back-end database to gather just the active encroachments and the manhole covers, and I've written a script that each week it'll take this data and just update this map each week, so it should be live for the last week. Um, I know that some folks, like Aaron in Region 3, have been asking about permits data. This is only filtered to Region 2, as you can see, but um, you could take the filter off or add it to other stuff or different regions. Um, one thing we like, that we want to do is we don't want our gallery to be too clustered. Right now it has two pages of stuff. We almost want to try to keep it to one page, but so we made a, a projects gallery that's just basically, we have some, our projects map, which is just active projects in Region 2, and we also want to showcase some things like this, uh, let me open this up. In Region 2 we're working on the 215 reconstruction from, I think it's from 4700 south to 201. And it's kind of a big in-house thing that we're working on. We'll probably develop this into a story map at some point. And once this loads, I can show you the data we put together for it. Open this one up first. So here, when you're zoomed out, you can just see this, the three major interchanges that they're working on. And when you zoom in closer to them, the map starts changing and the layers will start coming on based on the scale you're at and the speed of your internet service. Wow. That's really big SR 201. Oh, there's some of it right there, but kind of going off of your model, Paul, but some people want to change the bridges to blue for some reason. I'm not sure why. <laughs> but that may change back, but this is just a way of showing what's gonna be reconstructed with the 215, uh, with the SR201 here, and also the two different interchanges. You can scroll out and go down south to take a look at them. One thing I did wanna show off is this uh, Region 2 Projects Filter app that some folks, I think that they knew more about it, they probably would use it more. And what this does, what the, the district engineers in Region 2 have requested to see where our active projects are and we also want to use these little filters so you probably can't see them very well, but you can 
filter on each of these projects based on who the resident engineer is or who the project manager is or also with a date range. So just for example, if I look at um, filtering by resident engineer, it's hard to see. If I click on this button here, this is a, a live data link to our layer that's coming every day. It's updated live from EPM. When I drop, click on this drop down list here, it gives me anything that's ever been put into the blank for a resident engineer. So you can see there's a little bit of quality control issues we can probably address. Some people are listed five different times with misspelling of their names or they put their first name first and last name second, things like that. But just an example of how this would look. This is hard to see. But I want to see everything that Marwan has, is working on right now. If I click on his name and click apply, it zooms me way out here. Um, you can see there's 32 different projects that, that he's listed for. Each one has a little brief description. So some of them are scoping, some of them are being closed out, so he's still listed there. But it also highlights them in blue if I want to zoom into certain areas to see um, the, the projects that he's working on and things like that. But the real important thing that they wanted to use this for that I haven't really shown this to them yet is they want to see where projects do not have an engineer assigned and who should be assigned to that. And what I've done here is, let me turn off these, the city layer so it looks a little cleaner. Um, if I click on this back here, go back to the options and clear, this, clear the results here, um, what I want to do is take a look at anything that is unassigned and I can add this as an operational layer. What that means is it just, it's its own separate layer, so I can just have it turned on. And hit apply, and right now I can see there are 204 projects that do not have a person assigned to them. Um, some of them are in scoping. You can see some are in stip mode, some are being closed out, so I'm not sure what that means per se, but let me turn off the projects here. And you can kind of see just my blue layers here. That this, these projects here do not have a, an engineer assigned. What I've done with the help of Sarah and with Ed, we've made some polygons showing the different shed boundaries. And so if I want to see where Marwan's shed boundaries are, I click this on, and anything in red is what he has, I don't know, these were jurisdiction. This is the, 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 the different sheds that he works with. So just graphically or visually looking at this, I can see these projects right here likely could be assigned to him. However, some of these resident engineers overlap boundaries. And so if I look at Sean Lambert's here, his blue ones over here and on this one over here also overlap. So maybe either of those two guys could be assigned to this. So this could be a useful planning tool for our district engineers to see where they need to assign their the resident engineers to help with construction projects. And I can look at the other engineers as well. There's more overlap here. and so on and so forth. And one word map I wanted to, to focus on, there's a talk going on in room 200 right now that's uh, focusing on this right now that I'm supposed to be in, but oops, I'm here. Um, this is the Region 2 Maintenance MP3 Map Tool. They, went, they used to call it the three-year plan. I guess that was too generic or too, too used. And these are maintenance projects that aren't assigned project numbers and things like that. They're kind of smaller things like painting, striping, fencing, and things like that. And what this is, it's just a simple map that's put together from a spreadsheet collected from all the 15 sheds in Region 2. We consolidate the spreadsheet and update this map every time the spreadsheet updates. And so they can look at their individual sheds and see what kind of projects they have going on, like a structured project that's going to cost $171,000 and things like that. But are there any questions about the Region 2 gallery that you all have? Yes? Are you managing those individual spreadsheets? The individual spreadsheets, I believe, are managed by shed. the shed foreman. Yeah. And uh, there's a rotational engineer in maintenance that runs a, a macro on, on his master spreadsheet that consolidates all the 15 spreadsheets together. And I think he, he applies a little bit of quality control to it to make sure it's not something in the wrong place or something, something too crazy. N not, not, not that I know of. These are just planned. They're just planned to be in the next three years that they need to be taken care of when they have the time to take care of them. I'm not fully aware of what goes on involved with the maintenance 
the maintenance sheds. Yes. Yeah, it can be. It's it's pretty. It's a pretty simple process, really. Um, all I'm using here in this map is this. This is our our new projects layer. This everything is listed as a line instead of a line or a point, so it's just easier to have one geometry. And um, I just have it filtered to region two. But I, if I wanted to make this map for region three or something, I can just filter it to region three and um, add this this kind of data here, where it, it, this this thing pulls from any resident engineer, so it's, you'll see a list of all the resident engineers, all of, all of UDOT, and so it's not really um, focusing on region two, but yeah, it can be applied to really anywhere. That's a good question. Any other questions? Okay, Aaron, up to you. Uh, before I get into mine, I want to talk, kind of, continue on what Adrian was saying a little bit. When we go, let's see if we have a map. Do we have any maps pulled up? I guess we don't. Um, currently in a map, when you click on a line, I had that one turned off. Go figure. Um, you can have all the data points. Here we go. So this one has a description of all the different information in it. Whenever you click on a line, as far as you're saying filtering to region th two versus three. We can filter by any of this information. And often we have more information than what we display. Um, we can pull things from EPM, from o uh, OMS. So we have a lot of flexibility. Um, as you see, our, what we we're each of the region has been doing things slightly different. So you see things, feel free to come to one of us with ideas or questions because that's generally where we get the idea for how to create more maps, how to push the limits. Esri has a lot of flexibility, and we're just scratching the surface, figuring out how we want to apply it to our projects. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and start with our gallery. Another comment that was mentioned earlier was ownership. And you went to Basin. This was a study that was done a couple of years ago. And so we asked for the complete study to be electronic. So the whole entire study is wrapped up in several various different maps. Um, some of them are, we do have a couple documents that aren't PDFs. And within the maps, they just have a lot of different information. Um, I'll show some of that in my, one of my story maps. Lately, within Region 3, we try and, try and look at things a little bit different. Instead of looking by project by project, looking at a corridor. And two of the major corridor study maps we've done recently is I-15 and US-40. And those are two I want to kind of touch in a little more detail of what we're looking at. Um, so we started with kind of a rough overview, just some of the economic growth. Depending on what format the aspect ratio of your screens, you'll see some of them will show up with, and this is pulling in the app mode. So in your mobile devices versus a desktop computer. Um, in these, you can either swipe across to see the next one or choose up here to click through. And as you get through, we're looking at different, just kind of has an overview of the whole I-15, looking at different things on it. Um, funded projects, and then if you went to the morning session, or heard Carlos speak, the whole swipe to see future development. So it kind of really paints the picture of what is coming, how it affects business. You show all the different businesses, how the road will look, how it will imply, how it will change in the upcoming years, help plan for the future. Um, like always, we did the same kind of thing for studies. A lot of this is repetitive, and we inputted videos to get people's opinions. 
both um, US 40 and I-15, we've added on the bottom just a feedback. Uh, goes to a Google Doc, and a couple of us have, are notified when information is put in, so we can tailor it to what needs to be done, what needs to be changed, how we can improve it in the future, so we're always progressing. And then, okay, the 40 is very similar. Um, we went and spoke with people from US Fort, from the commissioner and mayor of US 40, or not US 40, but that area to really get understanding of why it was important to them. So we can use this to really tell the public the purpose. Uh, a lot of this information in the US 40 corridor was taken from the Uinta Basin study as well, and then pretty much cleaned up to become more user friendly. So it was at a, making it convenient for people to view, to use. A um, couple things, how to utilize it. These are all links to the different sections. You can always <coughs> click through the buttons, take it back up. If you request a map from one of us, there's a lot of flexibility that can be simply tailored and added in there. Um, when Adrian was showing the filters, could add a filter for a drop down for region, the RE, those are all custom things that can be created. So likewise, the swipe, um, the swipe feature, this little button here, was a, it was added. So pretty much to explain back, going back to the services maps, I created a map with these layers on it and then converted it to an app to have, add this little feature. So that's the only thing, the difference between the map and the app version of this one is its use, usability, what, it has, what features it has available. Um, going back to the 40, <coughs> and we can add links to out, outside sources. So this bumps you back out to another, back to the Uinta Basin's full study to help people tie the whole document together if they want to know more, because right now we have it filtered for just for US 40. Um, we took all the accidents and tried figuring out, okay, how do we display this data better? Um, currently, it was just a lot of heavy points, took a long time to load, and it wasn't telling the story we really needed to. It wasn't useful. So we went ahead and converted to what's called a heat map to kind of pinpoint where the areas of large concern. Um, I don't want to waste your time by going through a bunch of things, but everything can be clicked on to make larger, so you can see things better for the public. And going back, once again, so we have all the pop-ups information. Should be popping up. There you go. And we can customize what is information that's in here. Um, so that's, are there any questions about, for me? Please. So it looks like you have, you're able to put a lot of different types of media, videos. Um, I'm curious, you showed, you guys showed um, uh, 215 uh, improvements that you were, you can see the lane configurations and the things. So is that, and then in the, in the swipe one you showed just a minute ago had a land use plan. Like, are, those, are those GIS layers or are those from CAD or? Um, yes. So pretty much what we do is we take a, a CAD file and take the shape file from it, convert it, and put it in as a shape file. So we convert it to a GIS file from CAD lines. Um, I guess it's our current funded projects. And that's just nice because there's these other formats where people are working in, right? Yeah. So I have one in here. I don't remember exactly where it's it's at. It's in US 40, but yeah, it has the line works as well. So it's very user friendly. I know Paul's going to discuss more. They're working on more project by project, creating maps for them. Any other questions? I let Paul show. Hi, my name is Paul. I'm with uh, Region 4. Um, we're, at, we're excited to uh, demo kind of what we've been doing 
information and data that we put inside our gallery, but also highlight, like these other regions did, highlight what we're doing and how we're using uh, services, content that's provided not just by the central GIS team, but also by the software provider itself. Um, <clears throat> so it, it looks like everybody else's gallery, right? It, we're all dumping content that pertains to you know our region, what's most important for us, uh, who's our intended party, um, or you know we've been talking about this Hilldale uh, story map. Um, we feel it's important to to be in our gallery so people can see it. Uh, we worked with uh, Horrocks on Bluff Street and Sunset. Uh, that's their gallery. We're linking their their data, their content, I know we talked a little bit about this, to, to our gallery. Um, it's not always hosted in our, on our own servers, but we can access it through here, or individuals can access it through here. Um, <clears throat> our right-of-way department has a, uh, li a licensed surveyor that also is pretty GIS savvy, and he too helps the right-of-way department um, gather data, dump data into GIS that helps the right-of-way department. And so we've got a, a right-of-way gallery that uh, he's built that has basically anything that he feels he may need, his survey techs may need to help them or support them out in the field. Um, we have, we've been, uh, so in July, the software provider has this big conference, and I've been going for quite, quite a while now, and uh, they've, they've rolled out these story maps that everybody's been talking about. This, this presentation was built, Corey built it for us, uh, using Esri's story maps. And uh, when I got back, um, I showed my pre-construction engineer and said, hey, look, this is a tool that we might be able to use, and right away we utilized it. I think I did four uh, story maps for different corridor studies or uh, not necessarily studies but maybe presentations that uh, our leadership group needed to w wanted to to interact with maps more than just a, a PowerPoint presentation and so we've we've adopted the story maps in uh, region four we are I'm gonna kinda talk about this life cycle of, of a project and it starts here at these corridor studies um, I don't do the studies. Uh, we've got individuals that do the studies. I just put the GIS data together. But what we're essentially doing is a consultant or in-house, we're saying, okay, between this mile post and this mile post, uh, this needs to happen. Is everybody familiar with corridor studies? Nod your head yes or no. Well, um, we can, we can uh, help you understand what they really are. But they're basically breaking down these corridors that could range from miles and miles or just a short, short section and giving, giving us their opinion based off of a professional opinion of what should be done. And so <clears throat> we're using story maps. We're, we're allowing the consultant to, to build these story maps for, for that corridor. Uh, uh, Aaron with Region, Re, Region 3 did it with uh, US 40, did a really good job with that. And, we kind of adopted it and just said, here you go. Here's the tools. We want you to go for it. We want you to do it. And uh, um, I think we were pretty successful. We had uh, Lochner do I think this SR9 corridor study. <clears throat> uh, Becky mentioned we're still kind of figuring out what the best route this is, but Lochner is hosting this story map internally, and we're just capturing the URL and displaying it within our own gallery. Uh, we've got some ideas that we're gonna bring to them and, and or with the GIS, Central GIS group, and say, hey, I think this is, these are the pros and cons of, of how we've done things and stuff. And, um, but, it, but it's nice, it, it allows the user uh, to go through and, and just say, okay, well what, Virgin Flats, westbound passing lane, well what are they gonna do there? You can zoom in, you can click on I mean, same thing that all of these other GIS analysts have been showing us. You can get the metadata from, from a single line. And I think that's one important uh, key factor about GIS is we can, we can not necessarily just tell the story, but we can add data and data and data to GIS. And 
it, it really has helped in, in public settings. Um, another story map that we built was this uh, hur uh, in Hurricane SR9 again in Main Street, on Main Street. We had a designer build this one. Um, I developed or I gathered the GIS content for him. I gave it to him and said, okay, go ahead and build your story map. Because I don't know what the designer or the project manager needs to say. I can make it look pretty, but we need the we need involvement uh, and that transparency across not only our designers, but also the consultants to say, hey, look, this is what we think. These are our recommendations. And I mean, he, he built a really good story map, um, went to a uh, public hearing, uh, gave the link to the city office. It's on Hurricane's website right now. People can go look at it. The public can give public comments. Um, it, it really is a nice tool. GIS is a nice tool to get that information out there. Um, another one, a, a big project, is the Bluff Street project. So we've got a project, uh, Boulevard, St. George Boulevard and Bluff Street, and then also Sunset Boulevard and Bluff Street. There, are, I don't know how many blocks are between them, but they're essentially north and south on Bluff Street themselves. And, and uh, this was the first one we built, but it, it allows us to be transparent. It allows us to get that information across to the people that need to see it for one um, and hear it, but then also make those decisions. Um, I can help support, build the data, but the decisions are those, the leadership group, those people that are out there talking to the public. And so we're using, that's the way we're using story maps. Um, we're also taking, kind of remember the story maps, I'm gonna bring that life cycle back, back to this. Um, we're also taking, and we have been for the last, I'd say year and a half, two years, I haven't been keeping track, but taking all design data, CAD design data, and dumping it into GIS. Um, any ma major reconstruction we're bringing into, uh, into GIS. It hasn't been simple. Um, we've, we've hit a lot of roadblocks. We've worked around them. Uh, my designers have been very patient with me to say, hey, look, your, your data is not working. Can you tell me why? And they say, it, it works for us type of thing. We, it, it's, it's this, uh, we're working together, we're collaborating together, and it's, it's been really, really good. Um, we're uh, developing, I'll just zoom into some of these areas so you can see, but uh, we're developing standards uh, not all of the de, not all of the styles that we're using is that of uh, CAD standard styles. Um, it has been asked or a, a task for me to get that done. I'm working on it, Becky. <laughs> but um, we're we're taking this data. I mean, very very intuitive data um, at. The public, the public can look at. I've said that before. I mean, we're just giving the information out to the public to look at. Uh, those people, I, I've always said throughout my whole career in GIS, GIS is a tool to allow those that make those critical decisions to make it happen. And, that, and that's what we're doing. Um, to touch back on the design data, we're currently working, I'm working with Bob Peterson and Becky, trying to get a, a, a tool um, to dump the data from MicroStation right to GIS and it, uh, seamlessly do it. Uh, we've, we've worked with it, we've developed a tool that works in MicroStation. I'm now developing that tool inside GIS that it, it I don't, can't remember who in my region or someone said it's like hitting the easy button. It really will be. I mean, it's, some of these projects take me, especially on these ones, I don't, permissive left rights when they're displayed, all the, the dash data, the the different sizes of uh, stop bars or four inch white line, all that type of stuff. It, it, it's, it's been a, a it, it's been difficult bringing that metadata from MicroStation into GIS and we're, we're, we're way beyond getting that done than we have been in the last year. And so um, our intent, we've got a little committee together is to push that out to the consultants, let them work with their data, give us the GIS deliverable and uh, you know, it, it allows their GIS team or their designers to, we'll provide the tool if you help us and provide us the data. Um, one other thing I wanted to touch on with the design is we're working on, a, so like I said, every reconstruct, we're taking that design data and dumping it into GIS. Um, 
we've taken this story map, this storyboard idea, and we're, we're breaking it down into a project now. We're taking this life cycle of, of uh, the corridor study, and now we're just taking a little chunk of it out, and we're looking at just what's being designed at the time. And so one of the designers in our, uh, in our region, Sam Grimshaw, he's working on this design, and he is the owner of this, uh, work, this design life cycle application. And it, and it really is an application. It allows him to go into his milestone meetings with this application and say, okay, here I am with my design. They're not, he's not bringing in a stack of Lem by 17s and saying, okay, this is what we're gonna look at, this black and white piece of paper. Uh, we're, let's, let's, we're gonna get into this application. We're gonna look at the information. Um, <clears throat> so every time, every milestone, there's the uh, geometry review, um, plan in hand, PSE, and final. And we're dumping data, CAD data, at each of those milestones. It's not just a one time and we're done. Um, we want to be able to tell this story of this project from start to finish. And it's not for just us internal. We're doing it for you guys. We're doing it for the public, for everybody to look at. And um, so this life cycle application, design life cycle application, is a, is a tool that the designer is going to own and he's gonna take ownership of it and say, okay, here's my information, guys. Let's go to this milestone meeting. Um, let's pan around, let's look at this information. Uh, cut and fill lines, let's see what those look like. Um, he, he was able to add some of this, inf some of this information, um, some other data on top of this map himself. Uh, that, there's, a, there's a tab for that. He can go in there and it's called the design issue resolution. So he can go in here and say, okay, guys, Here's our issues we've got. Let's, let's break these down and look at them. And as they break them down and resolve them, he can either get rid of them on the map or change them a different color and say these have been resolved already. Um, one big one that I like to point out is uh, there is a, a, a cattle guard right here. Um, it's, it's an older cattle guard. We've got to preserve it. It's got to be, it's just got to stay in there. But at our current and this is getting way beyond me in design stuff. I'm not, I don't design, but this fill, this fill line is going to cover that up. So now they've got to resolve this issue. What do we do? Um, and so he simply, he took a picture. This is a picture of the cattle guard right now. And uh, through his milestone meetings, he said, well, what if we just uh, took that cattle guard and we put it down the road, that, that dirt road a little bit. Would that resolve our issues with this? There's a fence line they had to deal with, and then uh, that, that, that fill line. And it, it satisfied the uh, requirement to, to move that. And again, he just showed it at this, in this application. Um, we're also, 60 percent the uh, plan in hand is is completed i've got it in my email right now to convert the data and once that's converted i'll let him know he'll go in and plug it into this application it'll be there and in two weeks he'll have his milestone meeting and all the partners players of that project will come in and they'll open this up and say okay where are we at this allows them to go back and forth well what did, what did our 30 percent look like at milepost 11 well, they can go in and look at it. They can look at the different cut and fills or whatever aspect changed about that project. So like I said, we're taking this corridor study and we're breaking it down. We're taking a section of that, let's say there was a five mile uh, funded project. We're taking that five miles out. We're, we're building these types of story maps and then we're putting it right back into that corridor study and saying, okay, here's what we ended up doing on this. I mean, because those, Life cycles, I mean, the uh, corridor studies could, could range for I don't know how long. I mean, they, they, could, they could take years to actually complete what that study may, might, have, might have recommended. And so those are just some of the things that we have inside of our, um, our gallery. Those are some of the things we've been, we've been working on. Um, one other application uh, that, that we've been 
playing around with, and I, and I looked at this at that conference in the summer again, is, is dashboards. Um, they're kind of big right now in the data world, and we had, it, it, it answered, it told a story and it answered our question. And then we were able to go and, and uh, act and try and resolve this, some of these issues. But we had a section of I-15 that um, we had a lot of incidents. And we needed to figure out why. We had a lot, of, so then we pulled that incident data out and said, okay, let's look at uh, wet conditions, let's look at uh, the snowy conditions, slush, um, in some of these places up to the north it is icy. Um, so we looked at all that and I wanted to, to give a product or a, a tool to the, uh, the transportation team, the leadership team, because they're the ones that needed to make the decision on what did we need to do to resolve some of these issues. So just a couple of real quick uh, um, tools that are embedded inside this application is uh, you, can, you can add layers to it, uh, help, help stack layers on top of each other. Um, you can filter the data. They're, they're set up pre-filtered. As you notice, when I filtered this data, um, this column here changed. Let's say we wanted to look at this incident on mile post 10. You click on it, and the metadata shows up. Uh, you can figure out inside the list detail. It was in December. On December 3rd, it was icy conditions. And then on the bar chart, you can, you can see overall that year, you know, where, where was I at? Icy conditions had, was that a seven? Seven incidents that year. And so it, it allows, allows someone to go in and, and, and look at the data, look at the metadata in a usable format. Um, we overlaid some of these uh, higher area, concentrated areas where we had maybe some fatalities or, or, or I don't know the different breakdown, level four and level five incidents. We needed to figure out, well, why? Well, we pulled manly data, and uh, we looked at our, our surveyor did some of the, the data mining, and we looked at some of the uh, cross slopes. Well, what do our cross slopes look like in this area? Well, we're, we're identifying them not to be re really good. I can't remember the, the color coding, but red meant uh, it, it didn't meet our standards. And so that was a place that they flagged um, they were able to go out and do some terrestrial scanning and figure out more in depth what, what really is going on in that area. And, and we, we sat in a meeting, we used this tool, and was able to, I mean, it was, it was slick. We had the data we needed. Um, we were able to get to where we needed to go, um, and, and it really streamlined the process. Um, does anybody have any questions? I guess I'm done for now. Got five minutes left. Yeah. No. Okay. No. It would be to the PM okay. or the resident engineer. Any other questions? Not yet. I mean, we could build a script that does that. We um, did have one out that wasn't that difficult to make for long range plans. So there is something we can do. Well, thanks. Thanks, Paul. I'm going to go over a couple other tools, three other tools that are available to you through the data portal, uh, in addition to Open Data and UPlan. They are Highway Reference Online, Linear Bench, and the Report Auto Generator. Um, I'm going to go fairly quickly, but keep in mind we have tutorials available on the data portal. We're available to answer questions, and we're also available to do additional training if you decide that's necessary. Um, starting with Highway Reference Online, you've seen a lot of dis data displayed on UPlan. You've seen data available through Open Data. Uh, all, most of that data is made geospatially available via the Linear Referencing System, or the LRS. And what that is, is that that is us taking a geographic line and associating measures with that. And with the Highway Reference Online, you're able to access that and actually see the line and the measures. 
you can access it a couple different ways. You can either display all the state routes, all the different routes, and you can navigate into the map and click on a line. That will enable the table at the bottom of the screen, which has all the different features that were run on that route. You can download this to a spreadsheet, or you can look at it here. Using these points, we calibrate our, our linear referencing system, and that's how we're able to geospatially locate a lot of data. If you don't know where a route is located, you can access it through a drop-down. If you know what county it is in, you can filter it by county and then further filter it by a route. So you can see that in Box Elder County, uh, we have these routes available, and I'll pick on SR38, and it zooms to 38, and here are the features that are collected along that road. If you hover over a point, in the bottom left-hand side of the map, you can see what that feature is and where. So you got point zero, point 0.908 and milepost 2. So you can see where those features are on the road. One of the other tools available through the data portal is Linear Bench. A lot of the information that was shown earlier is accessible through the linear bench also. And using the routes and mileposts, you can access that. So the first window that you see lets you pick a route. I will pick Route 65, because that's the one I was messing with earlier. And it shows you the extent of the route. This route goes from 0 to 28. For the sake of this, I will accept the whole route. And we have a few different categories. Next, I'm going to show you the report auto-generator, which uh, gives you summary sheets uh, for blue and pur or orange and purple books. So this is a predefined category, these preservation quantities. It lets you see all the different layers that are associated with that tool. You can click Add All Layers, and if you've added something you don't want, just click it again, and it'll go to the right-hand side. Once you click Go, you can see a lot of information is piled onto this screen. The upper left-hand side shows you the route and locate the route and milepost that you chose, and below that shows you all the different layers that you picked. In the main screen, it shows you an instance of all of those different assets. So you can see here are the, are the barriers, bridge locations, pavement striping. There are no rumble strips in that section, sign faces, and so on. On the right-hand side, you got an arrow, uh, laser point. You can see that as you move right to left on the linear bench, you can see on the map, the little cursor, thank you. You can see the cursor's moving along on the map so you can see where, the, where you're looking. In the bottom is a table that again shows you all the information associated with that. That's enough for now, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, similar to how Uplan functions, you can click on a feature and access a pop-up. So there's two barriers in this location. I'll click the top one. And it gives you the information associated with that barrier. Um, for those of you who are familiar with RoadView Explorer, I'm going to try this. I'm going on, an, on a limb here with the way the internet's working. You can actually jump to that feature. So this is a barrier. I'm going to go to RoadView Explorer. This is Java, so I'm going to allow Java to run. It's going to tell me that it needs some more permission, probably. No, it ran to it. So you can see right here is the barrier. It takes you right to the start of that barrier. You can do that with most of the layers accessible through Linear Bench. It gives you a picture of that. And also, I should point out, in the bottom part of the screen, it tells you the date of that picture. So moving on to the report auto generator, since I chose the preservation quantities filter, I have all the layers necessary to run that. In the upper left-hand side, you can export th this, which is all of these tables down here. So each tab is a different uh, tab in a spreadsheet. So pick the selected route segment. I don't recommend ever clicking all routes. That's a lot of data. Uh, pick all the layers so that you get all of these layers, and then click Export, and you'll get the spreadsheet. That spreadsheet looks like this, which is very similar 
to the bottom portion of the linear bench screen. It tells you the extent and it gives you the location of all the different features along that route segment. Back to the data portal, on this main screen in the middle, there's a link to Report Auto Generator. If you click this, it takes you to the Google Doc and you can download that document. That document looks a lot like this document. Not that document, it's loading. Hang on a second. Well, all the times I tried this, I never thought Excel would break the presentation. There we go. So make sure content is enabled, as you would do. And if you click Generate Orange and Purple Book, it asks you for the PIN. This is simply what the um, resulting spreadsheet will be called. I'm going to be unique and call it that. And you hit OK, and it's going to ask you a series of questions. I'm not a pavement engineer, so if there are any pavement engineers in here, do not gasp in horror at the options I pick. Uh, it's going to start by asking if I want all of the, bear, all of the guardrail or just the uh, substandard guardrail. I'll pick all the guardrail. What region is this project in? I'll pick region two. And that's accessing uh, PDBS to get you to the different costs for the different um, features of the road. We'll do a mill and fill. I'm just going to, like I said, go through and pick these options because it's my presentation and I'm going to. So I don't know if that made any sense at all, what I clicked, but I'm going to submit that. And again, trying to give you an idea of what is available, what it can do, not necessarily have you memorize exactly what I'm doing. So here's your concept report. Everything in orange you can change. So if you know that the traffic control is going to cost a little bit more, you can change this number and it will change all the estimates. So you can see what would have taken maybe weeks, maybe a few months, you can do in about five minutes. This is not the be all and end all. This does not mean you're done. This does not mean that this is 100% correct. This gives you a very good starting point without having to step a foot outside of the office. It gives you information about the barriers. It tells you what kind it is. It gives you the end section. It gives you a safety checklist, information on, information on surfacing, pavement markings, and sign information. It also has comments as to why a sign might be labeled as substandard. It says faded paint. So that was a very quick overview of a few additional tools that are available to you through open data. Uh, with that, or through the data portal, I'm sorry, in addition to open data. Sorry for stepping on stairs, toes. Uh, with that, any questions for me or anybody else? That's the end of the talking portion. Yes? Who enters the data? Who enters the data? It comes from the various source systems. So if it's the asset data, the Manly collection that was mentioned earlier, it's housed on SDE. It will be soon housed in OMS, hopefully. Some comes from uh, o or, uh, EPM, Pontus, all the various source systems. Sorry, what, how is it accurate? It's within a few, diff a few inches. It's based on the LIDAR information that was collected. At least the, I mean, it's varying depending on what source system you're talking about. The asset information uh, that Manly collected, it's within a few, uh, that's within a few feet, I believe. Is that what you're asking? Okay. Any other questions? For anybody, any of us? We try to have everything 
to make it easier. We try to have everything public facing. Everything that we've shown is all public. I don't think any, anybody showed anything that they had to log in for. So. Did you want to add to that, Becky? Just that we have very few things that are private. We have very few layers. Almost everything is public. Um, and um, I just kind of wanted to add to kind of part of what Paul was saying and was mentioned earlier. Uh, if you heard Carlos's keynote, um, you heard him talk about uh, story maps as a way that we can communicate data. And um, I just wanted to point out again that uh, our presentation here is based off a story map. And you also saw story maps that were embedded within this one. So um, they're a powerful tool that I think you'll be seeing a lot more of uh, in the future. And once again, go on Whova and like our presentation and leave any feedback. <laughs> and any other questions? All right. See, all the more reason to like our presentation. We ended 20 minutes early. Enjoy your evening.